Campos, the financial aid administrator, and of course, Dr. Harrison Rommel, our financial aid director. Um, I want to give a big thank you to Joni Beter and Ruben Reyes from NMEAF for hosting this presentation today. We really appreciate it. Now it is my pleasure to welcome and introduce our Higher Education Department Cabinet Secretary, Stephanie Rodriguez. Thank you, Mia. Can you hear me? Yes. Good. I had to connect on my cell phone. You all weren't joking when the connection at our satellite uh, office is a little spotty, so please bear with me. Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for joining the New Mexico Higher Education Department and our valued partners at the New Mexico Education Assistance Foundation today discuss financial aid problems. It's been a long day. Do you guys know I've been on travel for four days and I'm here in Albuquerque today, so please bear with me. But we're really excited to be here to talk about the opportunity and lottery scholarships with you all today. I am Stephanie Rodriguez and I am the Cabinet Secretary of the New Mexico Higher Education Department, but also I'm a proud graduate of a New Mexico institution. I had the privilege of going to the University of New Mexico, so I hope we have some of our Lobo advisors and financial aid folks on the call today with us. So as you know, New Mexico made history in 1996 by being the first state in the nation to tell recent high school graduates that they could go to school tuition free. And that was the lottery scholarship. But we also know there are so many more people that may have stopped out of school, maybe a working parent, or have to work full time that would also love an opportunity to go back to school, but could not afford it. So that's why we're so excited to offer the opportunity scholarship which is the most accessible and comprehensive tuition-free college program in the United States. However, we understand there's a lot of questions when it comes to the Opportunity Scholarship and what we should be sharing with our students. And I just want to give you a little 411, but I know my team will cover this for you. It covers 100% of tuition and fees at any New Mexico public community college or university. That's 29 institutions, including our tribal colleges in the state of New Mexico. It accepts students pursuing high need certificates, all associate degrees and all bachelor's degrees, so long as you don't already have a bachelor's degree. And my team will get into all of those specs. It also lends the opportunity for students to attend part-time or full-time, so minimum of six credit hours. And the greatest part of it, our lottery and opportunity scholarships don't require lengthy applications. They just have to apply to your school and then your financial aid teams do all the hard work. I know how hard you work of making sure they have those valuable dollars so that they can go to school. Now, with that being said, I wanna close it with this. I had the opportunity to be in Las Cruces this week. And I was there for capital outlay hearings. And my niece and nephew are going to Doña Ana Community College and then hopefully going to New Mexico State University in a couple years. I sat down in two meetings with both my niece and nephew. And I have to tell you the level of and the quality of service and what you do to provide information simply to students is so incredibly amazing. And I want you to know that we value your work. We appreciate your work. And if it wasn't for amazing advisors and financial aid advisors being in the room with students, families like mine would not go to college. It's hard. It's complicated. It's not easy. When you're learning English as your second language, and then you go through school and you may have not had all the opportunities at your feet, just having somebody there to hold your hand and tell you, this is how you register for classes. This is how you read your financial aid package. These are the things you qualify for. These are Pell Grant dollars. This is what you can do with Pell Grant dollars. It makes us feel at ease and that we can go to college and we can be successful. So shout out to Doña Anna Community College and Miss Megan. You were amazing. If she's here today, she might not be. 
but I want to say, I know the work you do. I value it. I've seen it in person. And thank you all for being here today. Me, I'm going to kick it back to you and our partners. Thank you, Secretary. Really appreciate it. All right, everybody, we are um, going to start with the presentation. Um, Dr. Harrison Rommel will be presenting. And if you um, have any questions, there will be an opportunity to ask those questions at the end of the presentation. We will also be um, sending this presentation out to you via email later today. So, um, okay, go ahead, Harry. Thank you, Mia. Thank you, Madam Secretary. Um, yes, we're, we're all a little punchy this morning because we had a lot of driving the last week, uh, but I'm really glad to see everybody here. We have an amazing turnout. I'm so happy to see all these people uh, joining us for this presentation today. Um, I just kind of want to preface it before I put up the slides. Um, you know, uh, as as many of you know, we we had a, a marathon to uh, get the rules published in time for the fall semester. I can't thank my financial aid colleagues enough for all the feedback that we got. Um, it's been it, it really made it for an incredible process. Uh, that being said, we know that that rule and statute can't anticipate every single student's circumstance, um, and. Just as you've been fielding a lot of questions from your students, we've been fielding a lot of questions here, both from financial aid staff and advisors um, and, and, and students and parents. So what we've done is we've tried to distill, distill uh, some of the most common themes and questions um, into some slides. Um, so I'm gonna go ahead and see if I can get this pulled up here. And I'm hoping that folks can see my slides now. Mia, are we good? Uh, yeah. So again, thank you to, uh, thanks for everybody joining us. It's such a huge turnout that is just amazing. Um, thank you, uh, NMEAF, for a lot hosting, um, because we we wouldn't have been able to do this uh, without NMEAF because we have such a huge turnout. And so we really appreciate them letting our, us letting their, uh, us use their Zoom license. Um, so I'm just going to dive right in here. Um, here's the basics. The essential elements of the Opportunity Scholarship, students have to be New Mexico residents uh, unless they are a member of an American Indian tribe that's contiguous with New Mexico. Um, institutions can require uh, request uh, uh, verification uh, through letter or some other verification, tribal ID uh, from those Indian uh, nations. Um, the scholarship does pay for up to 90 attempted credit hours for an associate degree and 160 attempted hours for a bachelor's degree. And we do need to emphasize the word attempted there, not completed. Um, that's pretty generous, I think. Uh, that gives students, you know, the chance to maybe uh, switch switch majors at some point if they have to or if they want to. Um, we're really pleased to have that flexibility. Uh, there is a minimum of six credit hours and a maximum of 18 credit hours in the fall and spring semesters. Uh, that was the determination of the legislature that they didn't want to fund students who were taking more than 18 hours because they tend to uh, not have as good a success rate because uh, they're quite frankly taking too many classes. Um, students with disabilities, just like with the lottery scholarship can have a credit hour reduction. Um, one beautiful thing of how this works uh, in um, synergy with the lottery scholarship uh, is that Students can enroll in the summer for three to nine credit hours, uh, and they can receive opportunity funding, um, even if they're uh, also receiving the lottery scholarship. Um, but they do need to maintain continuous fall and spring enrollment. Summers are optional. Uh, with that 2.5 cumulative GPA, and because we want to give returning students every chance we can to succeed, we're, we're making that 2.5 cumulative GPA start beginning the first semester that they receive the opportunity scholarship. Um, that is, you know, we don't want a student who is say, you know, a 2.45 or a 2.0 who can get that GPA back up. Uh, we don't wanna exclude them immediately. We wanna give them a chance to succeed. So that's how we're setting this up. Um, as the secretary mentioned, we have enough funding to pay 100% of tuition and fees this academic year. We're gonna keep trying to make that promise um, every year. Uh, there are of course levers uh, that are outside my control. Uh, the legislature appropriates funds. 
uh, but we know we had good bipartisan support for the scholarship. And we think, you know, because the state budget's looking pretty healthy, things are looking pretty good for the next few years. Uh, we are going to enter into M memorandum, uh, memoranda of understanding with our institutions to outline maximum tuition awards uh, in future fiscal years. We are committed this year to 100% tuition fees as that memo that I sent out on July 8th articulated. Um, for the financial aid managers out there, uh, just a reminder that you will do a drawdown just the way, the same way you do the lottery scholarship. You'll submit draws for actuals to Heather Romero um, in the fall and the spring. Um, the opportunity scholarship will top off uh, the lottery scholarship if the remaining tuition fee charges. Uh, in this case, it would be um, mainly fees. Uh, because we also have enough money to pay 100% of the lottery scholarship for recent high school graduates this year. Um, and, and so we've worked really hard to create a symmetry uh, and a symbiosis between the lottery scholarship and the opportunity scholarship. Um, so, uh, you know, we do encourage students who came out of high school. Part of the reason that the legislature kept the lottery scholarship and didn't just make everything opportunity is because we, the, the state, um, as a policy, wants recent high school graduates to enroll full time. Now, they still have that 16 month window, that gap year the lottery scholarship allows, and they can take up and then get, uh, take advantage of the opportunity scholarship then if they're going part time. But we do have the expectation that those recent high school graduates uh, do enroll full time within that 16 month window. Um, students can earn multiple workforce certificates. Um, we are currently uh, compiling the list. We have a list of in-demand uh, jobs from the Department of Workforce Solutions. What we're doing right now is distilling that down into a set of a, a dozen or so SIP codes. So as long as uh, classification of instructional programs for the non-data, the institutional data nerds out there. Uh, those SIP codes, if those certificates are within one of those SIP codes, it will qualify because we know that those jobs are in demand. Um, and then, of course, associate degrees and, and up to a bachelor's degree. Uh, we've also given the financial aid officers broad administrative discretion when it comes to exceptional mitigating circumstances. And this is for the 2.5 GPA or the credit hour requirement. Um, you know, students do need to petition them for those circumstances on an individual basis. But the, you know, the philosophy, the driving, you know, uh, the, what we're trying to drive in policy is give every student every opportunity to succeed. Um, now, a little more detail. Um, the bridge or 3% institutional scholarships for you know, your typical traditional full-time going to be a lottery scholarship student. Uh, we don't want the opportunity to supplant those institutional scholarships in the first semester. In the second semester uh, and moving after that, those institutional scholarships can help those students with the cost of attendance lottery and opportunity kick in to cover tuition and fees. And then if a student's receiving an institutional scholarship, they can use that for books, uh, cost of living expenses, those types of things. Um, in the event that we don't have enough money to pay 100% of tuition and fees uh, with the opportunity scholarship, which is not the case this year, we again mapped it very similarly to how the, we've done the lottery scholarship in the past where we have a scaled tuition award based on the available funding and by the sector. Um, so the scaled award mechanism is going to be exactly the same as the lottery um, in future years if we find that, you know, uh, enrollment is doubled at the institutions because everybody wants to come back to college. Uh, these would be good problems to have, but we'll figure that out down the road. Uh, we don't have to worry about that right now. Um, we did uh, put a clause in the rule for uh, homeless and emancipated students um, in, in the event that we don't have enough to pay 100% of tuition and fees. Again, not the case this year. Um, We've again allowed the institution's broad discretion um, for exceptional circumstances for students and probationary periods, which have to be renewed on a per semester basis, um, you know, for students who experience a loss in the family, um, other types of circumstances that, you know, you know, are, are, are well documented. Um, and, you know, again, with the philosophy being that we want to give students the opportunity to succeed. Uh, we do know st some students will lose eligibility. Um, that's just a given. We know that happens. Um, and they may petition for reinstatement uh, of the opportunity scholarship after two years. 
Um, but for that that two year window, they are on the on the hook for their own tuition fees. Uh, fees are mandatory fees for all students and course specific fees. Um, we do have some uh, restrictions. Uh, some institutions do allow for fees to pay for things like uh, uh, student activity centers, climbing gyms, things like that. Uh, those those will not be allowed. Uh, so anything that services institutional debt won't be allowed. But the broad majority of fees uh, will be covered. Uh, course specific fees are right now at fifty dollars per credit hour in the rule, but uh, institutions can petition for exceptions. Uh, on a case-by-case -case basis for certain high demand certificate programs. Um, we don't address differential tuition, but we will work on that in the MOU. That's only for a couple of institutions. Um, and then the MOU uh, will cover tuition fee structures, uh, maximum awards, which is again, this year is 100% of tuition and fees. Uh, we're not gonna talk about you know wraparound services or put other types of conditions on the institutions at this time. Uh, but, you know, when, when we do have certain fee structures uh, uh, that, that may or may not be allowable or differential tuition rates that may or may not be allowable, we'll articulate those in the MOU. And I'm very pleased to uh, announce that we have a new general counsel. Uh, his name is Peter Kovnat. He has a he comes from the Legislative Council Service, but he's been uh, involved in higher education legislation for many, many years. Um, and he'll be working with us on those MOUs as we get those out in time for the fall semester. Um, again, I've already said a couple of these things. Um, we've already defined, uh, we've defined fees within the NMAC. Um, under no circumstances will a student receive a check or uh, you know ACH uh, deposit in their account for a lottery or opportunity award. It's up to 100% of tuition fees. Uh, but no excess shall be applied. Um, other state scholarships, uh, such as the Nursing Loan for Servant Service, the Student Incentive Grant, uh, the uh, and Teacher Prep are applied first. If there's any balance of tuition fees after those scholarships, those state aids are applied, then Opportunity can top that off. Um, again, contact us for fees exceeding $50 per credit hour. Um, and you're always welcome to reach out to me for questions about, you know, I know there's, as the secretary mentioned, there's 29 different institutions and basically 29 different fee structures. So we're trying to, you know, I know we can't fit everything uh, into these three buckets, but we're really trying to as best we can. Um, now, we're kind of getting into the questions. Um, so I'm gonna go, I don't wanna read all of these verbatim, but some I should read verbatim because we've gotten so many questions about them. Uh, I think the, the questions on this particular slide are, are pretty, pretty straightforward. Uh, and again, of course, we'll have these slides available to everyone and we are recording this webinar as well. Um, so let's talk about some GPA questions. Um, what if a student has under 2.5 GPA in their most recent semester or their cumulative GPA is behind, below 2.5, do they qualify? And the answer is perhaps uh, we can give them a probationary semester. Um, we expect them to get at least a 2.5 in the probationary semester. And we would like to see uh, institutions work on an academic progress plan uh, to get that student up to a cumulative 2.5 as quickly as possible. Now, sometimes that is mathematically impossible. Um, so the next question is, what if they can't get a 2.5 cumulative GPA and will reach 90 credits before reaching the 2.5 GPA? And, and based on the statute, the law, which we cannot, you know, we can't get around that, uh, and the regulatory requirements, if they can't meet that, they're not eligible. Um, that's unfortunate, but, you know, that's, we have to we have to abide by the statute. Um, what if they've received at the end of the first semester is not established a cumulative 2.5? Um, again, we could try to work on the student within a reasonable time frame. We want to give the scholarship to every student given every chance to succeed. Um, now, again, you have broad discretion to work with these students. Um, you know, I, I would say that you know, in the cases where, it's mathematically impossible, and we have this statutory regulatory uh, constriction that we can't give them the opportunity scholarship. 
maybe you can look at other sources of institutional funding to help those students out. Um, again, we don't want to supplant institutional funding with the Opportunity Scholarship, but hopefully we can, you know, you can work with those students. But every time we can, if there's any way that we can work within the regulatory framework to give a student a chance to succeed, that's what we want to do. Um, if they are substantially non-compliant, then again, we have a two-year window where the student, if they lose eligibility, they've lost, they've exhausted any probation, um, any other circumstance, exceptional circumstances, then there is that two-year two window that kicks in where they're not eligible for that scholarship. Um, does a student need to be a U.S. citizen? Uh, no. Uh, they have to establish New Mexico residency, uh, which does require U.S. citizenship except for uh, students uh, who uh, meet the non-discrimination uh, classification. Uh, and those are students who received the, their high school equivalency or graduated and have had a year uh, a year residency in the state. Um, so those students would be eligible. Um, what if a student lost the lottery scholarship? Can they receive the opportunity scholarship immediately the next semester? Uh, only in a probationary sense though, um, they, they may receive it. Is the summer semester mandatory? No, enrollment is not uh, mandatory, it's optional. Um, now, if a student's pursuing a bachelor's degree um, and has multiple associates, do they qualify? They will not qualify. Uh, there is a 160 attempted hour cap. Again, the scholarship is, uh, the opportunity scholarship is uh, allow, allows multiple workforce credentials, certificates, one associate degree, and one bachelor's degree. Um, students can, if, they, if they're close to the 90 or 160 hours, uh, they can get a prorated award. Qualified students in their graduating semester can get a, a tuition scholarship proportional to the number of credit hours required to graduate. Uh, so they can, if they need fewer than six hours, uh, they only need four hours to graduate, just as we've done with the lottery. Um, you know, they can they can petition and and, and reduce that credit hour requirement. Uh, consortium agreements may apply for students in the 90 credit hour range. Uh, again, uh, do work with your students who, you know, this is mainly UNM and CNM for consortium agreements, but make sure that you're, you're you know, whoever the home institution is, uh, that you're tracking those credit hours carefully. Um, does the 135 mile waiver apply? No. Uh, the residency for students who are within 135 miles of the uh, of the institution. So, for example, uh, a student from El Paso who's going to New Mexico State or Doña Ana, they are allowed in-state tuition, but that does not make them a resident. Um, so they're not a resident. They're only eligible for the the tuition reduction to the in-state rate. Um, I know there's a lot of these, but again, this is distilling a, a lot of the questions we've been getting. Um, if a student loses eligibility and does not receive an approved probationary semester, are they eligible within two years? No, that's within the lottery code uh, and the opportunity, excuse me, the opportunity code. Um, they're gonna have to petition for reinstatement after two years. Again, though, you know, we give the financial aid officers broad and you know and the registrars for that matter matter broad discretion to you know work with those students on a semester by semester basis uh you know the you know as long as we see those students they should be continually improving and and falling within the criteria that you uh have prevent have provided for that probationary semester don't make it a moving target Say, oh well, all right, we'll make it, you know, nine credit hours this time instead of twelve. Don't do don't do those types of things. Uh, but you do use your discretion. Try to give those students the opportunity to to improve their grades, to to meet the requirements and succeed. Do they need to fill out a FAFSA? No, but as but as you know, we we strongly encourage every student to fill out a FAFSA. Uh, we don't want to leave any of those federal dollars that those students may have on the table. Um, you know, we've done some sort of broad back of the envelope calculations, and we know that there's probably, you know, somewhere in the order of 20 to 30 million dollars of unclaimed Pell Grant money that our students could be getting had they just completed the FAFSA. So we always encourage 
uh, FAFSA completion wherever, uh, whenever possible, uh, but it's not required for either opportunity or lottery scholarship. Um, based on how the statute reads, it has to be the lead financial aid officer to make the final approval of any uh, appeals or probationary requests, uh, approval of exceptional mitigating circumstances. Um, advisors, other staff can make a recommendation, but per the statute, the lead financial aid officer needs to, to sign off on, on, on any probation. Um, are early college high school students uh, eligible to get another associate degree? It does not provide for the funding of more than one associate degree. So an early college high school student who graduates with an associate degree, well, we would expect them to go get a bachelor's degree, not a, not a second associate degree. If they wanna get a second associate degree, we ain't gonna stop them, but we ain't gonna fund them. Um, what does Opportunity Scholarship cover for lottery students, our returning or our recent graduate students? And remember in the code, in the New Mexico Administrative Code, we have two main categories of students. Recent graduates, recent high school graduates who go on that lottery track I was talking about earlier, and then returning adults, uh, you know, older adults who may have entered college, maybe their first time in college, um, but they didn't just graduate from high school. They're, they're a few years out of high school. Um, and, you know, those are the students that really the opportunity is designed to help the most, but the Opportunity Scholarship does help those lottery scholarship students as well. Um, so if, uh, if a student does not qualify for a bridge scholarship or 3% scholarship, those institutional scholarships that we want to supplement but not supplant, uh, the Opportunity Scholarship can assist those students in their first semester uh, of a lot of, on that lottery track. Again, during that 16-month gap after graduation, students can enroll part-time, dip their toe in the water, uh, and the Opportunity Scholarship will cover them then. Again, with the expectation that that student is enrolled full time after within that 16 month window. Um, is there a GPA requirement for the 3% scholarship? Uh, can the 3% scholarship be given to returning students? Not every institution has a 3%, what they call a 3% scholarship, even though there is a, there's a statutory requirement about uh, in the, you know, part of your instruction and general funding the state gives you be devoted to uh, it, the 3% what was called the 3% scholarship, it's called the bridge, you know, first semester scholarships. Uh, it's, it's ultimately just a piece of your state funding that's supposed to go to students. Uh, but there's no GPA requirement for that in, in the statute. And that's, uh, and, that, and that's a very old statute. Um, it's something that we should probably be looking at as an agency about uh, updating to be better in line with you know, our lottery and our opportunity scholarship statutes now. Uh, but that question has come up uh, again. The bridge should uh, the bridge should not be supplanted by the opportunity scholarship in the first semester. Twenty six year old student working on getting their GED considered a recent graduate or returning adult. Uh, if they enroll full time in the first sixteen month, we would classify them as a recent graduate. Uh, with returning adults, though, we do know that you know they're getting their GED just so that they can you know continue their education. Um, we're allowing the institutions to use discretion and define them as, uh, as a returning student learner um, because we, we realize that, you know, these, these types of students, uh, if they can enroll full-time, then we're going to put them on that lottery track. But uh, if they're going to have to go part-time, we're going to allow part-time for those. Um, you know, really, we're looking, you know, focusing on high school graduates. High school equivalency credentials are a little bit different. Uh, especially for those adults that have been out of school for a while. Um, and so it's okay to qualify them as a returning student learner. Um, again, this is where your discretion and your judgment as a financial aid officer comes in. Um, what certificates? Again, I talked about this earlier. Uh, broadly, you know, we already know what, you know, the hot jobs in New Mexico are. And if if you search New Mexico hot jobs, you'll find a website that the Department of Workforce Solutions produces, which is called hot jobs. Um, so we know that things like healthcare, IT, STEM, construction, 
early childhood education, um, you know, uh, those types of workforce certificates are kind of no brainers. Truck driving, uh, plumbing and pipe fitting, welding. Um, again, we are working on mapping the, 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 the job classifications, the high demand jobs uh, to some broader categories that Workforce Solutions puts out a dozen or so. And then we're gonna map those to SIP codes for you. That way, if a certificate has a SIP code, that's in one of those categories, it's going to qualify as a workforce certificate. We don't want to, we don't want you to spend too much time and get into the weeds on, on individual certificates when we know that, you know, these are community colleges and your community colleges are, 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 are offering these workforce certificates because they know that there's jobs in the community for those. Um, and will they be the same across the state or by region? We're going to make sure they're statewide. That gives the most flexibility to a student. You know, uh, you know, someone wants to finish their nursing certificate and then move to the other part of the state uh, where their spouse is working in the oil fields or something. We want to give them that flexibility. So it's going to be a statewide list, not not by region. Um, yes, we realize that there's maybe not as you know, not as much of a demand for welders. Well, there's actually a demand for welders everywhere in the state, but uh, maybe that's not a good example, you know. Um, you know, plumbers and pipe fitters also everywhere in the state. So really, you know, we could classify it by region, but it's really not a, not a need. Um, here are the links to the administrative codes. Of course, the residency code, uh, which I know my uh, registrar colleagues on the, on the call are, well, well versed in, uh, of course, our uh, legislative lottery scholarship administrative code. There were no changes this year, and of course, our brand new opportunity scholarship administrative code, which was effective as of July twelfth. Um, and I need to give a huge shout out to uh, my team here, uh, not only my financial aid team, but uh, our constituent services coordinator Alicia Armijo, who did just an amazing job um, of. of making this code work. Uh, we're really proud again of the symmetry between the lottery scholarship and the opportunity scholarship. Um, it's never easy to roll out a new financial aid program. It's, it's particularly difficult when you have to make it work as best you can with other existing financial aid programs. But I, I, I think we've I, I think we've done a pretty good job of making these scholarships, the lottery and the opportunity scholarship work really well together with each other. The GPA, I'm not going to go through every list on this. We, this side by side uh, is available on our website and we can add this to the, the presentation when we send it out. Um, this is really more for um, uh, not only for institutions, uh, but also for your, your, your clients, your constituents, your students, their parents. Um, how do these work together? What are the differences? What are the similarities? The GPA is the same. Uh, the decoupling in the event that funds are not sufficient is the same. Again, we have a very healthy state budget. We're really, really pleased to be making our tuition promise again to, the, to our students, um, not only for the lottery students, but our returning adults uh, in the Opportunity Scholarship. Um, we have a renewal period, uh, again, for uh, two years. So. I'm not gonna go through all of these, uh, but I just wanna demonstrate that we, we've you know we've really tried to make these things work together, not conflict with each other. Um, and again, you know, we do have the expectation that those recent high school graduates go on a full-time lottery track. Um, you know, in exceptional circumstances, you know, a student has to go down to part-time uh, and they're gonna lose lottery for that reason. We can give them, the opportunity, but that is an exceptional mitigating circumstance. Uh, they can't just decide to go part time; they got to have a reason. Um, so, you know, that goes back to the question that was that was up earlier. Um, and again, you know, use your professional judgment as best you can uh, to work with these students, give them every opportunity to succeed. Uh, but you know, as 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 a teacher myself, I know that not everyone. Not everyone is going to, you know, uh, always comply with the regulations that we have in place. And, uh, you know, we do also do have to be mindful of the statute and those regulations. Um, 
Finally, at the bottom of the page, uh, reachhirenm.com is our one-stop shop. Uh, it's an online resource for students and parents and their families to explore uh, what schools they can go to, um, what part, you know, what uh, are, you know, what schools are near them. Not everybody knows what community college is in their in their in their neighborhood. Believe it or not, um, it is uh, basically you can you can do career exploration. You can actually there's links to the applications or links to every institution and how to apply. Um, there's frequently asked questions about the programs, um, and it really just kind of helps guide students and parents and, and their families uh, of, of how this works. What are your what are our expectations of of a, of a student? in terms of GPA and full-time versus part-time enrollment and that type of thing. Uh, and so it's a great tool and we encourage you to share this resource um, with your students and future students. At that, um, that is the conclusion of my presentation. I know there's gonna be a lot of questions. I'm gonna go ahead and stop sharing at this point, uh, uh, except for one last slide before we take questions. And just to say thank you, uh, here's our email addresses. You can always reach out to us. Uh, we do have a social media presence. Uh, I don't myself. I don't have a Twitter account, but our agency sure does. Um, and so, you know, we, we do encourage, you know, to, uh, every institution to, you know, let people know that they can reach us not only by phone, not only by our email, uh, but also through our social media. Okay, uh, with that, I'm gonna stop sharing so I can see people's faces. Um, so I know that was a lot uh, and that probably didn't cover every question you have. So we have plenty of time to answer your questions. Uh, again, we just wanted to distill down sort of the most common questions we've been getting as an agency to make sure uh, that, um, and again, I'm really happy for this turnout to see everybody here. Uh-oh, we got a typo. It's a 16 month window. Sorry, I'm seeing, I'm seeing questions coming in. Uh, so Jenny, um, we need to fix that. I don't know why that turned into 18. Uh, it is a 16 month window per the, the lottery statute. Uh, sometimes these numbers just get switched. So we'll fix that immediately. Um, copy of the recorded presentation. Yes. That will be available from NMEF. Thank you, Mia. Can I just ask a question real quick? Sure. Okay. So if a student loses their um, opportunity scholarship because of the GPA, they have the two year uh, window before they can request it back, right? That's correct. Um, okay, um, what if they reestablish that 2.5 within that uh, two year window? <clears throat> Interesting question. Well, I, I think, I think what no, I think what we need to be doing in this case is 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 working with the student on the front end with the probationary semester. Um, and if they lose and if they can't do it in the probationary semester per the administrative code, it's going to be two years. If they reestablish it, um, I think I'm going to go have to go back and read the code to make sure that we are clear on this. Um, if they reestablish, I don't think they're going to be eligible, but. Uh, I don't think we can do it on the back end after they've lost it and they're in that two year window. Um, but I'll go back and read the code and see if there's, you know, if, if we can, if, if the petitioning works, I think really we should be working with them on the front end to get that GPA back up. Um, if they lose it, they lose it. Uh, mm -hmm. And then it really will be two years. I think that's going to be, have to be the answer for now. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Uh, let's see. I'm trying to go. Harry, we do have another question. Um... How soon are students made aware that they are being awarded the New Mexico Opportunity Scholarship before or after the semester starts? That is going to be a question um, that's going to have to be answered at the institutional level because everybody packages things a little bit differently. You have different deadlines. 
Um, based on the memo that I sent out to the financial aid directors back on July 8th, they should be able to award everybody before the fall semester starts, everyone that qualifies. So they should be providing that award. But again, because every institution packages things a little bit differently, has slightly different deadlines and, and when they roll these things out. I mean, you know, I know UNM was working on, you know, fall awards back in April, right? And, and, and you know, and, and I apologize that, you know, with a brand new, with a brand new scholarship, a brand new aid program, uh, you know, there's a little bit of kind of flying the plane as we're building it. Um, but the plane's pretty much built now. We know exactly what we're going to be awarding, and that's 100% of tuition and allowable fees. Um, so those, I think students should be hopefully getting those award notices uh, before the semester starts. But it really gets, that's something at your institution, and I don't know what where you are uh, based in your institution. You may be an advisor. I don't know. I can't tell. But something to work with with your financial aid office. There is another question uh, regarding New Mexico residency eligibility. Where, will there be an exception made for students in military families transferring to New Mexico in their senior year of high school? We can make that accommodation, yes. Uh, that's, that's allowable, I believe, within the residency code. Um, again, as long as that, um, you know, if, there's, if, if their parents, and I don't have the residency code up in front of me, but I know we have, uh, we I know we have uh, those types of allowances for children of parents who's who are military. Uh, we also make the exception, uh, you know, for on the other on the other side, just so to remind people, um, we we allow uh, resident for for New Mexico residents who take their who say they're stationed in say Japan, and they take their uh, kids with them to Japan and the kid graduates from a military high school in Japan. Well, we'll make the exception, we'll make an exception for them. That's an exceptional mitigating circumstance of graduating from New Mexico high school. Um, they maintained everything else. They're still New Mexico residents. Um, so we'll have to go look at the code on that. Uh, but I believe we can make that accommodation. All right, Harry, there's another question. Will the institution need a transfer transcript similar to what they do for lottery with transfer students? Uh, yes. The answer is yes. <laughs> Just yes. All right. There is another question. If a student uh, completes a bachelor's degree but already has 140 credit hours, will they be awarded money for 20 hours only, or would that extend until they complete their bachelor's degree? Only up to 160 hours. So they could get the 20 hours, um, but anything above that um would not be covered by the opportunity scholars that is that is prescribed in statute there's no exception to the 160 hour cap okay the next question is the two-year probationary period basically excludes students at a community college they may be done with the program by then and while i understand we should work with them on the front end students often have highly fluctuating gpas every term that can change four times within a two-year period. Uh, that is true, uh, but you know the cumulative two point five GPA is still prescribed in statute. Um, so that's I think that's more of a statement than a question. But I, if I turn it into a question, what do we do about highly fluctuating GPAs? Well, you rely on the word cumulative. Um, but that is, you know, that's, that is prescribed in statute. Um, it's not a 2.0, but it is a 2.5, but it is a cumulative. And again, please work with the students, take advantage of your, of your discretion as a financial aid officer to allow them probation. Uh, but the student needs to be continually improving. It can't be static. Okay. The next question. Um, is student, um, students receiving VA benefits or employee tuition waivers, are they eligible for the New Mexico Lottery Scholarship? Uh, can you repeat that, Mia, and make sure I got it right? Sure. 
Um, are students receiving VA benefits or employee tuition waivers eligible for the scholarships? Yes, they are. And those can be applied towards cost of attendance where allowable. Um, now, um, employee tuition waivers, uh, you know, those are paid if the employer, if the employee is paying part of the tuition, then opportunity can cover the balance. But, you know, if, if the agreement with the employer and the institution, they pay tuition, then they have to pay tuition. Um, but opportunities, and, and, and that's not, and that's really private aid. Um, you know, if it only pays part of it, it's not really considered state aid, but again, the opportunity scholarship can only cover up to 100% of tuition and fees. Um, you know, that's, so that's gonna be sort of have to be treated on a case by case basis. Uh, for VA benefits uh, or National Guard benefits, um, those really are a form of compensation, even though they're considered financial aid. Um, and so those could be applied after, those aren't considered state aid, the National Guard Scholarship, for example, we consider that com compensation. We consider state aid to be anything administered out of this agency. Um, so those could be applied afterwards as well to have a co help cover costs of attendance where allowed. Okay, uh, Virginia Tucker um, asked, you indicated differential tuition will be addressed in the MOU. Students want to know their eligibility now. Do you recommend that we exclude the differential tuition until further notice from the HED office? I do recommend that, yes. All right, the next question is, could a student maintaining above a 2.5 grade point average be allowed to take any time off from school and still be eligible for the scholarship? Absolutely, and that is where the, that is where, uh, the exceptional mitigating circumstances clause kicks in to petition, um, there's got to be a good reason. We, we can, you know, we, we, and we expect, we make the expectation that students have continuing eligibility. Um, but if they need to take a semester off, they can document a good reason to take the semester off. Not just, you know, I want to go to Mexico, but, you know, I want to go to Mexico because I'm going on a mission for my church. That's an exceptional mitigating circumstance, right? Um, or studying abroad, you know, a, a semester abroad or a year abroad, that would be an exceptional circumstance. Um, so they can take those out. They can take that time off. Uh, you need to work with the student. They need to document why, and you need to approve why. And it's got to be, you know, a reasonably good reason, not just, eh, I'm burned out. I need a semester off. That's not really, you know, now, you know, they could uh, get a doctor's note that says they're burned out and need a semester's off, and then that would qualify. So just, again, it's working with the student. We can't anticipate every single circumstance uh, of every student, but we try. And again, just work, you know, always work within the lens of what is the best, what is in the best interest of the student. That's the lens you always got to work from. Okay. All right, the next question is a lottery student who received lottery in the spring, spring 22, and prior semesters is only taking 12 credit hours this fall. Do they lose eligibility for both or can they receive the opportunity scholarship now? They should continue to maintain their eligibility for lottery. Um, so if they're only, I'm guessing this is at a four year institution where the, the credit hour requirement is 15 <laughs> instead of 12. Um, I, I would rather you give them a probationary lottery semester for if they had a good reason for only being able to take 12 um, than just kicking them over to opportunity. So um, again, we have the expectation that students who are on the lottery track stay on the lottery track. This is not an opportunity, no pun intended, for them to reduce their, um, you know, what, you know, for them to get out of their their, their, their obligation to us as we make our commitment to them to pay their tuition. We still expect the full time. Now, I will tell you there is some, there is the possibility that 15 credit hour requirement could change. That would require a legislative change. Um, but, you know, we've heard rumblings that that may be something that happens 
uh, in the future. Again, just work with probationary semester. If a student attends an out-of-state college or university and decides to come back to New Mexico, would they be eligible for the, new, uh, for the opportunity scholarship? Uh, have they, only if they've established residency in New Mexico. And again, residency is a matter of intent. So they, you, know, you could move back, but it's going to be at least a year before you can establish residency for tuition purposes. Okay, Kelly Durbin asks, how does it work for students who are below the 2.5 cumulative before awarding? Can we give them the opportunity and then keep them as long as they are getting a 2.5 in the semester, showing that they are working on bringing up the cumulative? Do these students need official an official academic plan? Yes and yes, and maybe yes. <laughs> yes to the academic plan, yes to the award, um, yes to maintaining the 2.5. Can these funds be applied to any graduate level courses? Only if a student is taking the graduate level course, a five, 600 level course, um, as, uh, as part of completing their bachelor's degree. So if that, if that course applies to their, if they're taking it as, as a, a condition of satisfying a bachelor's degree, um, yes. And I know some some undergraduate students take bachelor's or take five six hundred level courses. They'll apply. They usually don't apply as a five or six hundred on their transcript, but that does apply to their degree. So in that case, yes. But if they're in a master's program, uh, if they're taking it for a master's or a PhD program, then it does not not qualify. Okay. Uh, Virginia Tucker asked. Did you just state that a student who has completed their bachelor's degree within 140 hours is still eligible for 20 more hours after their bachelor's degree? No, no, that's not what I said. Um, I, the question was about a student who had say 140 hours before they get their bachelor's degree. Um, and then the opportunity scholarship would cover up to 20 more credit hours. Uh, what I also said, again, to repeat the graduate, maybe the graduate question can, uh, was part of the confusion. Graduate courses could apply as long as it's being used for the bachelor's degree. Okay, next question is, what if a student moves out of state their senior year and they are not part of a military family? Can they come back to New Mexico for college and qualify for the opportunity or the lottery scholarship? Again, we need to look at residency as a matter of intent, of an intent to stay within the state of New Mexico. We have something in the administrative code that's called inconsistent acts, which uh, moving out of the state would be considered an inconsistent act with intent to maintain residency. Uh, so they would no longer be a resident for tuition purposes. Um, so if it's not, you know, if it's not a military exception, um, yeah, they would not qualify. Okay, uh, Brandy asked, do attempted dual credit hours count towards the total allowed hours? And if the student is a dual credit student, which GPA is used for college? Is it their college GPA or their high school GPA? Uh, so attempted hours, if they're on the transcript from dual credit, would would apply. Now we are working uh, as as a state to really improve our dual credit policies to make sure that those you know those students are on a track to get that associate degree and eventually that bachelor's degree. Um, so the dual credit hours do count towards the caps. They do. Um, However, the high school GPA does not count. It's the cumulative GPA within college. Just as with the lottery scholarship, your high school GPA doesn't matter. It's your, um, it's your, it's your, G, it's your college GPA. Now, if you do have a, if you have a low GPA from those dual credit courses, then we've got, then, then we, you know, we're going to have to look very carefully at those students um, and, and how to treat that. And again, I think this is something where we try to work with them on the front end. If they're coming in with less than a cumulative 2.5, 
We need to get an academic plan in place uh, for those students. Um, I think over the next few years, you're going to see some changes to how we do dual credit in the state, and this shouldn't be a, this won't be an issue. All right. Are graduate students eligible for teach or grow your own teachers if they're planning to be a culture or language teacher? Navajo Tech offers a master's in Diné culture, language, and leadership. I don't have the teacher prep affordability uh, statute up in front of me. Um, I think we're going to have to take that. That's not really uh, germane to this, which we're trying to focus on lottery and opportunity here. Um, I would appreciate uh, if you could reach out to me directly by my email, and we'll take that question offline when I have an opportunity to take a closer look at the teacher prep statute. Okay, so would, the op uh, would the opportunity or lottery scholarship cover tuition and fees for a study abroad program if the program is offered through a New Mexico university? Uh, well, yes, uh, but we're not gonna pay, now there's usually a, now this, this is kind of another sort of tuition differential question. Um, and I would have to look exactly at what that study abroad program look, looks like. So. Typically for study abroad, we offer, uh, we do probationary semesters. Um, now, if there's a tuition and fee charge for that, uh, for that student, um, Opportunity and Lottery can pay the basic in-state tuition and fee rates. We're not gonna pay the differential for what the cost is to, for the, that institution abroad. That's gonna have to be on the student to cover. So just in round numbers. Let's say that your tuition and fees was $1,500. Your study abroad semester is gonna cost $3,000. We'll cover 1,500 of it. The other 1,500 for the study abroad program is have to be covered by the student. The next question is students who have adjusted credit option, how does this affect their eligibility for the opportunity scholarship? Uh, now adjusted credit option to me sounds like, I, I, I'm not sure, uh, I don't know who wrote that question, but if you could unmute yourself and explain what do you mean by an adjusted credit op option, because it means different things to different schools. What's that mean? Okay, adjusted credit option is when a student comes in and they've done, they haven't done well previously in their another semesters. So it kind of wipes out their previous semesters academically and they can restart over again. Okay, for so yeah. Federal if you're, financial if you're, aid, for federal financial aid, we still have to take those previous grades into consideration. Um, but for state aid, we don't know if we still take them into consideration or we don't. Uh, you should still take them into consideration. Um, the grades, again, we're trying to get students to accumulate 2.5 GPA. Uh, this is another inst instance where you can offer probationary semesters and work on an academic plan with the student. Okay, so we do take them into consideration. Yes. Okay, Okay. thank you. Okay, the next question is, if the student is on the lottery track, does opportunity automatically kick in to cover the fees of each lottery semester? Yes. As long as there's available funding, which there is this year, the answer is yes. Okay. Um, if a student obtained an associate's degree utilizing other funding, such as grants, would they be able to utilize the opportunity scholarship towards their bachelor's degree? Yes. They can't get a second associate degree, but absolutely they can take advantage of opportunity to get that bachelor's degree. And um, our PIO, Stephanie Montoya, provided an FAQ document that is in the chat. Um, it's a very helpful resource if you all want to um, go ahead and click on that link. Um, very helpful. Thank you, Stephanie. Okay, uh, Kelly Durbin from SFCC. If a student on lottery decides to stay at a community college after the three eligible semesters to finish their degree, can we give them the opportunity scholarship? Ah, okay. So, so the students used their three lottery semesters. 
in principle, they should have had their first semester, their first semester, their bridge. They they've basically had a, a qualifying semester and then three lottery semesters at that point. Um, so I think the answer would be no. Uh, we would expect that student to, um, you know, transfer at that point. Now let's say that they only need six credit hours to finish that associate degree. And that would be really, that would be a fifth semester at the community college. Um, that may qualify as an exceptional circumstance to get that associate degree. Um, and if it was, and I, so I'm guessing my, my initial thought is, you know, this is a case by case basis. We really should be seeing students have an associate degree by that third lottery semester. But if they didn't, um, you could offer them the opportunity scholarship for an additional semester, but you should caution them that that would possibly, actually it would, because they would still be considered a returning adult student. That would, they could do, you could give them the opportunity in that last semester, but then they would lose lottery and thus opportunity eligibility uh, for, for two years after that. So if they're planning on going to their bachelor's degree, they should just go straight for the bachelor's degree. So there's, it's sort of a, it's kind of, this is an unanticipated consequence, but it's what we have to work with that um, if you gave them that extra semester, then they have pretty much lost opportunity for aid for their bachelor's degree. They're gonna stop at an associate and they would say, I'm good, then that's fine. But again, advise the student that if they're going to go for, forward, that this would jeopardize their aid moving forward. Okay. Um, EMS providers like EMTs and paramedics often take courses for certificate with no college credit associated with it. There's a shortage of EMS providers across the state of New Mexico. Is there a way to get students in these classes covered by the Opportunity Scholarship? These classes often do not run along semester lines, and there's no way to get them college credits at this at the time. So, uh, you know, I actually had this discussion uh, with our legislators at the Legislative Finance Committee subcommittee. Um, we know there are some non-credit workforce certificates out there that are typically offered by employers, mainly, um, not all of them. And right now, the, the credit hour requirement is stipulated in statute. Um, they have to be a credit-bearing certificate program. Now, when I got my EMT license many, 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 many years ago, I earned six credit hours for that. So I know that there are credit-bearing uh, EMS certificates out there. Um, that is something that your institution should be looking at very carefully. Um, those decisions are, of course, made at, at, at you know at the at the executive, uh, the governing board level. Um, I can tell you this though: um, when your leaders know that there's money available for students, and possibly money available from the state, um, because a program is credit bearing, they're going to make that program credit bearing. Right now, a non-credit certificate does not qualify. Is there a difference in funding for returning students and students who take a break in attending? There's um, no differential in funding, no. Does it depend on whether or not they have gotten prior opportunity funding? As if they, if so, if the school can fund them again after that? So, oh, okay, so that's a great question. And, and a lot of that boils down to the fact that we're actually technically in the third year of the opportunity scholarship because we had appropriations and language in the budget bills the past two years. However, really this is the first year of the Opportunity Scholarship under a statutory and regulatory framework that we didn't have before. Um, so it's kind of a fresh start for students. Um, the qualification criteria were vastly different in 21 than they were from 22 than they are from FY F academic year 23. So if I understand the question correctly, can you uh, offer them opportunity funds if they got opportunity in the past? 
Yes, the qualification criteria are really the qualification criteria as prescribed now moving forward. If a student has three credits left to graduate and is in their last semester of lottery eligibility, can they be funded? And if so, would it be funded with lottery or opportunity funds? Can you repeat that? So I'm making sure you get that right. Sure. So a student has three credits left to graduate and they're in their last semester of lottery eligibility. Right. Can they be funded again through lottery or opportunity funds? Uh, they can be funded through lottery funds. That There is an allowance for that last semester in the administrative code for lottery. And, and in, in general, and let me ask, let me just put this in general. In general, um, where it is appropriate to apply the lottery tuition funds, you should always apply those first and then opportunity. And that includes probationary semesters for students who went on a probationary semester when, or, or exceptional circumstance for lottery. Remember, they're, they're still considered lottery students, even though they may not be meeting the full 12 to 15 hours, they're still lottery students, apply those funds. If a student has already, sorry, if a student already has an associate's degree and has remaining hours, of the 90 credit hours, can they use those remaining hours towards another associate's degree as they are not interested in seeking a bachelor's degree? No, the statute allows for one associate degree. Okay, this next question is a question uh, we get a lot. Does the Opportunity Scholarship pay for books that are added to tuition and fees as course fees by the institution? So, um, I think I wanna take that one offline to see what the scale of that is. Um, that, you know, if it's, a, if it's a fee that it's applied to every single student as a condition of enrollment, it's not opt-in, but if every student pays that same book fee uniformly, then yes, it would qualify. But if it's an opt-in um, or it's only applied to certain students, then no, it would not qualify. It would have to be, a, it would have to be applied to every student as a condition of enrollment. returning student that has holds at UNM, but they want to attend CNM, would the holds need to be paid at UNM? Well, in general, if that student um, wants any credits to transfer, then they're going to have to, uh, you know, to get that transcript released, um, they would have to pay that, pay that hold. Um, you know, these are this is more of a bursar's question than a financial aid question. Um, the institute, you're, you know, a, an institution does not have to uh, honor or require a whole be lifted on their institution. However, it may require that transcript. And if it requires that transcript, then that hold's going to have to be lifted. Um, you know, I know that institutions will work with. Uh, students, you know, make payment plans where appropriate to get those holds lifted, to get their transcripts out so they can continue their education. Um, that's a, that's more a constituent services question that we could definitely work with the students offline on. Um, but in general, they're probably going to need to figure out how to get the transcript over one way or the other. Okay, the next one is just to clarify, students are not re required to fill out the FAFSA to be eligible for lottery or opportunity scholarships. They are not, but we strongly encourage every student that can fill out a FAFSA to please do so. Are de uh, developmental or remedial credit hours considered when calculating attempted hours? Sorry, can you repeat that? Are developmental or remedial credit hours considered when calculating attempted hours? If they're if they're registered as credits on the on the transcript, then the answer would be yes. Um, 
the answer is yes. And I, and I realize this is very, this is a challenge here because, you know, developmental and remedial credits can really be kind of a tar pit for a student. Um, they, you know, we, we do know, however, that, you know, there's been a lot of reforms in how developmental and remedial education is being delivered. Uh, things like the co-requisite model where you're in, enrolling like in, uh, um, you know, English 101 and getting supplemental instruction rather than having to take remedial English, for example. Um, but if their credits on the if their credits on the transcript, then they do qual they do count. Um, next question. Okay. Um, at times, students in associate nursing degree programs are only offered nine to eleven credit hours in a semester. Will they be eligible for the opportunity scholarship or will they need to add an elective course if available? I mean, I'm just reading it to you. Uh, ah, okay. Well, this is, this is another case where you can make a judgment call. Um, we have, we, this is a case where, you know, we have some, some kind of conflicting priorities here as a state. We are really trying to support nursing students and expand and, and add to the number of, of nurses uh, in the state. We, we received you know, um, 15 million for nursing programs and 30 million for nursing faculty just recently. Um, so if they're offered nine to 11 credit hours a semester, would they be, um, Will they be eligible? Well, that's over the six hours. So yes, they would be. Um, are we talking about students who would be normally on a lottery track? If they were, um, you know, it depends if this is an institute, this is a two or a four year institution one because it's 12 or 15 hours. Um, I, I'm gonna say, you know, in this case, we would probably, if you had your, if you had your, uh, students who are recent high school graduates who are expected to be on that full-time track. Um, you could have them individually petition for an exceptional circumstances clause to reduce that credit hour requirement. We know how challenging the nursing programs can be. Um, and while it's only 11, 9 to 11 credit hours, it's a huge amount of work. Um, I wouldn't want to shoehorn them into an elective course. If we could, I'd say let's use the sex, let's use for these students, the exceptional circumstances clause. Okay, uh, Crystal from CNM asks, for programs that require some in, summer enrollment, but the credit hours required are more than the nine credits, can they still award that student, for example, students in rad tech in the summer take 11 credit hours? Ah, okay, and this, this is a CNM question and you know, this is this is another case where exceptional circumstances count. You guys really aren't on a semester basis, right? You're really more like trimesters. Um, and so we would treat this. So basically for CNM, who has a 12 week summer semester, call treat it as if it's a semester, treat it as if it's a fall or spring semester, because it really is closer to an actual fall or spring semester. Uh, that's uh, yes, you can award the student because again, you're you're not a typical eight week summer semester uh, like a lot of the institutions. Okay, Kelly from SFCC asks: A couple of our medical degrees have some very large lab fees. Are they covered? Um, you're going to have to petition uh, and request uh, a waiver for those, Kelly. And that waiver request is just basically. Um, send me an email uh, with a memo on SFCC letterhead requesting the waiver. And I think uh, Virginia Tucker from NMSU had a comment. She says, for federal funds, we count remedial hours over the first 30 only. Yeah, we don't have that sort of statutory exception for remedial courses. Um, that might be something that we could look at updating in the code if we're finding it's 
creating a real barrier for students. Um, but right now we don't have we don't have that exception that the feds do. Those are all the questions that I currently see in the chat, Harry. Okay. Wow, those are some great questions. Um, written Q and A transcript might take us a while to get that together for you, um, but I could see if we can do that. Uh, we could transcribe that after uh, Ruben and NMEF have uh, have started putting, uh, have gotten the recording set up and posted. Um, wow. Those, those were some great questions. Um, we can't cover every single possible student circumstance that comes up. Um, I think we've got, oh, we got Liz as a question. Thank you. I actually have multiple questions, so please bear with me. I just wanna clarify, um, you had mentioned earlier about fees, uh, capital outlay fees or anything like that are not covered. And I think you mentioned something about student activities fees that, that are charged to, to all students, like for use of gyms or libraries or anything like that. Could you clarify, are those covered or not covered? So if it's an activity fee that's charged for use of existing facilities, um, that's allowable as long as it's charged, it's a, as long as it's a condition of enrollment, right? Everybody has to pay this fee. Um, now, I know that in the past, additional fees have been uh, added specific to specific in, at, at specific institutions for specific capital outlay related purposes, like mm -hmm. building a new gym. Those would not be allowed. Um, any sort of fees that are used to levy to pay institutional debt. So if an institution goes out for a bond um, and it's using student fees to pay part of the bond, can't be, cannot be applied. Okay. Um, we don't basically we're not used. We don't want the opportunity scholarship to be used to build new buildings. Right. Sort right. Of philosophy. Great. Thank you. Um, and then going back to the to the non-resident students. So if a, if a if a student comes to the institution as a non-resident, they're not a New Mexico high school. They're just an out of state high school graduate. They're entering the institution as a non-resident. And then a year later, they establish residency. Are they eligible? Yes, they've established New Mexico residency for tuition purposes through intent, utility bills, apartment statements, bank statements, driver's license, all that good stuff. They're a resident now. Great. So yes. Thank you. Um, and then uh, going back to the person's question about VA, um, VA aid and opportunity, we have external scholarships or even institutional scholarships that are tuition specific, like they're supposed to go only to, to, towards tuition charges. So how do we prioritize um, those scholarships um, with opportunity? Do we apply the tuition specific scholarship first or opportunity first? So this is where the fiscal hawk in me kicks in um, and says, yes, if those are tuition specific scholarships and they can't be applied to other types of cost of attendance, you should apply those before opportunity. Okay. But if those other types of aids cover other types of things like books, then you can apply it afterwards. Okay. And then you said something about a waiver for large tuition um, charges. Could you clarify what that is again? Oh, it was fee charges for, oh. um, so if, Course specific fees are capped at 50 bucks a credit hour right now, which is pretty generous actually. And there, but there are some that exceed that. Uh, those can be waived, uh, but only on a case by case basis. I need a request from the institution on letterhead that says we would like the following fees to be covered by opportunity. Um, that, that, by the way, um, that uh, going back to you, Kelly, and your, you know that um, that memo should include the number of students affected and the approximate cost. Okay, thank you. And then my last question uh, to clarify on the students who their recent grads, they are taking the gap year, enrolling less than full time, they can be paid by opportunity for during that during that 
less than the gap. Full-time. Yes. They okay. Can. And what if they what if they choose to not enroll full time? That is that when we ask them to petition and use mitigating circumstance to keep them on opportunity? Yes. Okay. But they better have a good reason. It better be more than I don't want to enroll more than I don't want to take five classes, right? It's got to be a mitigating circumstance. Correct. Okay. Great. Thank you so much. That's it. Is that it? Good. That was a lot. Um, I have one. I have okay. one. Uh, this is Gary with Navajo Tech. And I'm concerned with our tribal members who are Navajo Nation residents, but Arizona and Utah residents. And um, in the PowerPoint that you provided, it states that I can award them. Um, and then also all bachelor's and associate's degrees qualify, correct? Uh, yes. So yes and yes. Um, tri- uh, members of the Navajo Nation that reside in Utah, Arizona, because they are contiguous with New Mexico, even though the border at Utah is really just a point. Um, yes. <laughs> it's still contiguous. Uh, so yes, they are considered New Mexico residents for tuition purposes. Yes. So you may award them. Okay. And then... Um, so certain certificates programs qualify, but all of the associates and all of the bachelor's program. That is correct. Yes. Okay. Great. We've been awarding, so um, I'm using this as a recruitment tool to to bring them over. Well, that's great. Thank you for that clarification. And, and we're really happy to be we're really happy to be supporting our tribal colleges uh, with not only this but all of our other state aid programs. So. Thank you. Harry, can you hear me? This is Mindy. Hi, Mindy. Hi. I'm I'm traveling, so uh, that's why I'm kind of speaking low here. On certificate programs, anything that's credit bearing, that's federally recognized, can we fund those? Uh, they've got to be part of the list that we're getting out for that are workforce appropriate uh, in okay. demand. Uh, again, we have the in demand list. I can tell you, Mindy. I know. I know your certificate program is pretty well because we've talked about a lot of them. Yes. Um, they're going to qualify. Oh, good. Thank you. Ray, we do have another question. Um, students who receive the Opportunity Scholarship but later complete their FAFSA after the drawdown uh, and are state aid eligible, what is the process for the Opportunity Scholarship adjustment? Well, now I can't think of any state aid that requires a FAFSA. And maybe I've just been, I've been in this job too long and I've forgotten more than I know. Um, But I I think, you know, the FAFSA really should be for their federal aid. Their state aid um, should basically, you know, we're talking about the student incentive grant, the the nursing uh, loan for service, the teacher prep affordability. None of those require a FAFSA that I can recall, um, unless Heather can think of one that I'm just not thinking of. It shouldn't. It shouldn't affect that. SIG. Uh, I'd have to go back and look at the SIG code and remember if that's. Uh, I think Andrea said leap grant. Um, the um, the student incentive grant did was a matching program for a federal program. So maybe that one does require the FAFSA. Um, so, and I, I'm sorry, I'm rusty on that one right now. Um, and, and by the way, we may be rolling SIG into opportunity because I don't think at this point that the, the feds are gonna bring back the leap sleep program. I could be wrong. Um, so let, let me see, students receive opportunity to later complete their FAFSA and are state aid. So that would be the SIG. Uh, I guess I the only one I can think of would be the student student incentive grant. What is the process for NMOS adjustments? Uh, well, that again we always apply all state aid first. Uh, so you would adjust their account to uh, charge the state aid, which would be the SIG, and reduce the opportunity award. Uh, when do you anticipate to have the list of the certificate eligible programs? Uh, uh, one of my colleagues is literally mapping the uh, the the job categories to SIP codes yesterday. So maybe by the end of the day, next week at the latest. Uh, 
Okay, so we got a late, uh, we got a straggler here. Before ending, can you please summarize the presentation? I can't summarize the presentation because <laughs> it was a lot. Um, we went over basically a lot of the frequently asked questions that we're we're getting uh, from institutions and from and from constituents. Uh, the question you came in with is whether new students who are letter eligible also receive opportunity funds, and the answer is yes. Uh, if they're allowable fees, lottery opportunity can kick in on those first lotteries. Okay. Oh, and Mia answered it already. Thank you, Mia. Other questions? Well, I know we didn't answer all your questions today, um, but we sure answered a lot of them. Um, you guys have my email address. You have my phone number, or and if you don't, um, what the heck? Let me give 160 participants my direct line. What could possibly go wrong, right? Um, but you can always reach out to us with additional questions. Uh, I just put, whoops, I just sent it to Alicia. I didn't send it to everybody. You can always look us up uh, at our website. Our contact information is there as well. I just put my direct line in the chat. Um, so um, again, please reach out to us for other additional questions. I just want to summarize by saying thank you. I'm, I'm just so humbled and honored to have such a huge turnout. I really hope this was helpful for everybody. Um, I hope that um, I hope this was going to help you as you work with your students. Again, you know, we can't anticipate every single circumstance for every single student, but where are we here? Why are we here? You know, we're here to help students succeed. And we always look through the eye of the lens of the student. What can we do best for the student within the framework of the law and the regulations, of course. Uh, but I think we've built a program here that's going to really really help us uh, you know, make sure that students succeed. So again, thank you to everyone. Thank you, Mia. Thank you, NMEAF team. Thank you, the rest of my team here at HED and everybody. Uh, thank you, NAMASFA, for providing a lot of those questions that we went through today. Um, Taya just gave our hotline. Uh, if you don't wanna to talk to me, you wanna to talk to someone else because you're not gonna like the answer I give you. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, but I, I, I hope this was helpful um, and I hope everybody has a wonderful Friday, a wonderful rest of the summer and a very successful and productive fall semester, which is right around the corner.